Okay, do you mind me being human? I'm just having some fun with you, right? Hey, I missed being here the last couple of weeks. My wife says she's been bothering me about going out here for 10 years, and I, I'm kind of like, I, I, I want to go to Green Bay and watch the Packers play. But we went to the national parks, and it was phenomenal. Saw Yellowstone, we saw uh, uh, Tetons, and we saw the Glacier National Park, and it was amazing. 12 wonderful days. Ate some good food. And uh, when you're young, guys, when you're young and you can eat your food and you can eat a whole meal, great. But when you get old, it's cheaper to eat because you can't eat a whole meal. <laughs> so my wife and I were like looking at these plates of food and we're like ordering one and splitting it, you know. And I need to do that because my ministry has been growing and I'm trying to keep that under control. I've enjoyed watching online, boy. What fun you had on the Labor Day weekend with the uh, team, team message and uh, showing your spirit colors. And, and I understand my, grand, my grandchildren had Baylor on because you know how you do that. You have to like uh, brainwash little ones so they know what's right. So, and uh, so uh, 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 you know, Baylor's, Baylor, I think, has won their last game. I don't think they're even going to be Kansas this year. I think they're toast. Uh, Iowa State played great yesterday. Boy, they fought like crazy against Ohio State. I, I was so proud of them. And uh, that, was a great, that was a great message. Uh, even though my son gave it on that, I will enjoy the whole service, the worship, everything. And last week, boy, Pastor Jeff, if you didn't hear the message on, on family legacy, oh, it's a great sermon. You want to listen to it. Uh, so here's the deal. You got two really good ones in a row today. Don't expect as much. And uh, lower expectations and all of that kind of thing. So... Turn to uh, John chapter 15 uh, and start with me um, in uh, verse number 12. I've titled the message, Friends, and boy, am I a rich guy. I have got so many friends, and um, I hope that today something that I say will help you. And I want to start off by just saying as you turn to John 15 that Jesus wants to be close to you. Did you hear that? He doesn't want you just to believe in him. He wants to be close to you. <clears throat> and he's reaching out to you. To be close to you, first he has to change you spiritually in your heart so that you can connect with him because God is spirit and those that worship, worship in spirit and truth. And you need a heart change. And when Jesus comes into your heart and his spirit comes into your heart, he changes your heart. Jeremiah says the, the human heart is desperately wicked. When we're born, the Bible says, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We're born, the first time we're born sinners. The second time we're born by the Spirit. And, and Jesus' Holy Spirit comes in and grace is a power word that changes our heart. And when he changes our heart, he helps us feel the way God feels about everything. And when things happen around us in the world, we see the way that God sees about it. We see it the way God sees it. We feel about it the way God feels, and we think about it the way God thinks. That's called conversion. That's called being a Christian. That's called having the heart of God. That's called being changed. And there's a power word of grace by the Spirit that we're changed. It gives us a God view and not a secular view of the world. And so at the close of the service, we're going to have communion. And when we do, I'll pray, and that prayer will give you an opportunity to ask Jesus to forgive your sins and remove any barrier between him so that you can be close, so that you don't live in guilt or shame. He doesn't want that for you. He says, today is the first day of the rest of your life. You can start anew, afresh. Jesus will forgive you, and then you can be baptized, and he will change your heart. And I'll give you an opportunity to pray that, and then... And then I will give you opportunity, if you're physically ill, to be God to touch you and heal you. Because God is a healer. He heals bodies. He heals, heals emotions. He heals relationships. He can heal anything. And he's real today. So then when we come to this communion table, uh, then we're going to pray that and then receive the communion in faith that our sins are cleansed and that our bodies are healed. And then I'm going to say, would you...
from. And if you believe in that forgiveness and you believe in the touch of God and you believe that you've been touched and made whole, then you step out from where you are and you come and stand here as a declaration, Lord, I believe that you're a cleanser. I believe that you're a forgiver. I believe that you come into my life and I believe that you are healing me now. How many could use a touch in your physical body? You'd use a touch in a relationship to be made whole. God hears and answers prayers. So we're talking about friendship. Today's Friendship Sunday, and I've titled the message Friends. And uh, the thing of it is, I'm a friend to a lot of people who are, who are not a friend back to me. How many know what I'm saying? You know, because you're being a friend doesn't mean you have a friend. Because you can be a friend to someone that doesn't know how to be a friend back. And the other thing is, just because you have a friend doesn't mean you're being a friend to that person. It's the same way with Jesus. He reaches to us. There's something going on here. What's going on? Am I mic wrong? Yes. Hi, boy. Hey. You're my best friend. Thanks. You're my best friend. Am I? Yeah. There we go. That should help. Is that better? When you're old, brush me off. <laughs> see, see this, that's my son there. See this tie? I bought this when Pastor Brett, before he was in the ministry, he worked at a clothing store 20 plus years ago. I still have it. It looks great. Mm -hmm. Some people know how to dress, then there's Pastor Luke. You know what I'm saying? I have visitors get mad at us because we pick on each other, but it's all in fun. We love each other. I love that guy to death, even though he has weird looking hair. But at least he has some. I'll give him that. So anyway, you, you can be a friend to someone. It doesn't make sure you have a friend. And, and so the first thing I want to look at is the character of a friend. But I want to read about Jesus, who is our friend. He wants to be your close friend. And it starts in verse 12 of John's Gospel, chapter 15. He says, my command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Not everybody is a friend of Jesus. The Bible mentions Moses was a friend of God. Abraham was a friend of God. It appears John was a pretty close friend. I mean, after all, at the Last Supper, he's got his head laying on the breast of Jesus, Right? If you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business. He doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give whatever you ask in my name. This is my command to love each other. So the character of a friend. Here's the deal. Guys. How many girls are you going to marry? One, right? If the right one comes along and you're with the wrong one, you may miss the right one, right? Girls, the same thing. If you're with a guy and he's not the right guy, it's a wrong relationship, and the right guy comes along, you might miss that opportunity. You need to be spirit-led in everything. Don't join yourself and think, oh, well, I have a boyfriend for now, but I know it's not permanent. No. No, don't do that stuff. In fact, don't date in high school, and that's not even in my notes. Just forget that. You can have a date, but no steadies. It just leads to trouble. Okay? Here's the deal with that in mind, is that I need to be, you need to be the type of guy that every girl would want to marry, so that if they married you, and you think you're perfect, don't you? So if they, you are pretty much. If they married you, you're like your dad. He was awesome. If they married you, they got a great husband because you carry the character of a Christian, of a godly father and a godly husband. And women need to, young gals need to be the same thing, that you carry the godly character like your mother, like your mother's, and that you are the perfect bride, the perfect wife to any man. But that doesn't mean you necessarily, you're only going to have one of those, right? It's the same way with friendship. I need to have the character that I'm the perfect friend for anybody I befriend. I think I'm a pretty good friend. I've got a lot of friends. I've got friends of all color. I've got friends that come from a variety of nations. I've got very, very poor friends. 
I've got very, very wealthy friends. I've got uh, friends that are sick. I've got young friends. I've got really old friends, and I've got like some that are really ancient, like Georgine. And um, so her and her late husband, the Reverend Alan Yulstead, are the one that asked me to start this church years ago, and I give them credit as the the founders of this church because of their faith in God and believing in, and having a vision and encouraging me to plant this church here. So I do tease her. We call her affectionately Grandma Georgine. Uh, she's somewhere between 100 and 140. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> but we can all have possessed the characteristics of a great friend. But we can't all be close to each other and to everyone. So there's layers of friendships. There's layers, because we only have so much. Remember Jesus, he had 12 disciples. Three were close, Peter, James, and John, and his closest was John. I can't be everybody's friend. And some people need a church where they're friends with the pastor and he's friends with everyone. And that's probably not healthy. In fact, the reason that we do fellowship events is for you to tie in in relationships and connect to people. Because when I did interviews with people this week about friends, one of the things they said to me was that they love coming here because they have so many great friendships that are close and loyal and they accept you and, and, they're, and it's strong. And isn't the church community, that's what it is? It's if, if we don't build connections and relationships, we don't have a system uh, of uh, support. It's like building a bridge. And once you love and once you reach and once you befriend, you've built a bridge to someone. And then when you're in trouble, that bridge is built and they can come across that bridge and help you. And that bridge is built and I can go across that bridge and help them. And it's important because a fellowship, a church is not a service and a song. It's a people. It's us together. And we need in the family of God to be close the way the a unit of a family of a mother, father, and children are close and that they should all be best friends and we should learn to be best friends. And I value and I know people that I love and highly value who have great character, but I haven't had the time to get as close to them as I would like to. Here's the priority is get close to Jesus because he's the perfect one. And his friendship will benefit you more than any human friendship. But human friendships were given. God intended them to be there. They're important. So you need to connect and make friends. Here's, here's, here's the thing. Jesus didn't want us just to be just with him. He gave us each other. He gave Adam Eve, and he talks a lot about relationships, a lot. All of Paul's letters are all relational. The book is relational. The great commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's relational. The second is like the first, and that's to love each other, preferring one another in love. That's relational. Loving God, loving man. It's relational. And so the character that, that we possess helps us to be a great friend. And I'm telling you, I have let friends down. I have made mistakes. You probably have too. I have done things because I'm human. I've done things because I've had blind spots. And, but I've benefited from friendships who would speak truth in me. In fact, when I moved to Berean in 1981, I first met Dale and Madeline Atchison. Dale's one of my best friends, helped to start the church. One of the first people that come to say, we'll help you. And, uh, he was on the deacon board, and Steve Wheats, Pastor Wheats, my boss that I worked with, uh, he was, a, I don't know how old he was when they moved there, but when I first met him, he was 12, and uh, he, was, he was older, so I was there, so he'd have been about 16, and, uh, and he came, and, and the church, Brian, you know, was taking kind of a stretch and taking a step to hire me, and so there was some discussion about whether they could afford my salary, but Wheats and I had worked together, so we went there together from Sheldon. And uh, S Steve 
thought I was independently wealthy. Now, this is a teenager view. I, I had this nice car. I lived in this newer, like, is a sixplex, like a duplex with this one unit, right? So he tells Larry Albers, who comes to the early service, he tells Larry, he says, Larry, he says, Dad, we don't have to worry about paying Weaver. He's independently wealthy. Steve told me. I had a th less than $1,000 in savings, but I'm independently wealthy, right? I didn't find this out till later because a, a few months ago, we got to know Dale and Madeline, and one night after church, he says, you want to go have pizza? And I said, well, and we're trying to live within the budget, not saying our savings. I said, let me check with Susan, see if we have the money. But Larry had told Dale that I was independently wealthy. So Dale goes, huh? So we sit down, we're at the, breakfast, we're at the pizza thing, and he says, uh, i got to ask you something. I said, what? He said, uh, you know, you were saying you didn't know if you could afford to go out and have pizza tonight. And uh, he said, aren't you independently wealthy? <laughs> I said, no, where'd that come from? Uh, so anyway, isn't that, but here's the thing. It's a characteristic of a friend. He's been like that ever since then, all the time. He delights in clearing things up and confronting. But you know what? I, he doesn't jump to wrong conclusions. He believes in my heart until he knows. So he could have assumed I was lying and trying to get them to pay. I'm independently wealthy and I need it all. So here, I don't know if we can afford it or we'll pay. No, he didn't jump to the conclusion. He just point blank says, I thought you were independently wealthy. Why are you worried about going and buying pizza out? So he let, you know, he talked to me. And that's what friends do. Love believes the best. There's a few things I, I want to mention to you. And Howard Hendricks says two things that will most influence you where you'll be in 10 years are the books you read and the friends that you choose. So choose them both carefully. In Proverbs 17, 17, talking about the character of a friend, the Bible says a friend loves at all times and her brother is born in adversity. What, is it, what are we saying? He's, he loves at all times. He's unconditional love. As a pastor, I struggle sometimes with do you love me? For me, as a person, as James, or who I am to you because I'm pastor, because I help you, because of the position I hold. You know what I'm saying? I just want to be loved for me. If I'm the garbage collector, do you still love me the same? Right? Someone that is unconditional love, they love at all times, that in adversity or whenever, when trouble comes, they won't abandon you, and they don't love you for what you can do for them, but for who you are. That's a true friend. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. The character of a friend never thinks they're better than others. I've had friends that they thought they were better. I could feel from them. They kind of looked down to me. I've had pastor clergy friends who think they're something big shots. I just let them think it because, you know, there's nothing I'm going to do. I'll just let them they think what they want to think. I'm not better than them. They're not better than us. We're going to answer to God. That's not even a thought we should be having. But a real friend is someone that will love you and whether you're poor or whether you're rich, they love you. Whether you're educated or uneducated, they love you, right? And by the way, if you have a wealthy friend, don't let them buy your meals. If they, if they insist, I mean, at least go Dutch or buy theirs sometimes. Because the same way that I can feel like I'm used and I'm only appreciated for what I do, people with money can feel like they're only loved or cared about because they have money. And people that are poor, and you go out with them and you know they struggle, if you can at all me measure it, bless them. Because there are two things that Christians always do, and I teach it to my fifth grade class on Wednesday. Christians are givers, and they're forgivers. They always do that. True Christians forgive and they give. So don't, don't be selfish. Don't, don't be conceited. Value others more than you do yourself. Put value there. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with each other. In other words, forbear. In other words, put up with each other. If you're going to maintain friends, you got to put up with something. You thought, my wife is my friend. She's put up with a lot. That's not funny. <laughs> if 
It's called acceptance. When I ask what are the, one of the great traits, it's being accepting. You bear with each other that. And then it says, and forgive one another even as you, if any of you rather has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Real Christians forgive. And that makes some people angry. But Jesus is so serious about it that the Bible says not once but many times that if you don't forgive, he is not going to forgive you. Well, that's not fair. He doesn't know what it's like to be hurt. Oh, yeah, our sin put him on the cross. And if someone's hurt you, forgive them anyway and don't mean them harm. And if they're still sinful and evil, Love covers a multitude of sins. You pray for them if you want to be spiritual and don't beat them up with words. Forgive them and pray for them. There's a poem that was written. And it was written by George Eliot. It says, a friend is one to whom one may pour out the contents of one's heart. In other words, I can get, tell you everything in my heart. The chafe and the grain together, knowing that gentle hands will take and sift it, keep what is worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. We all have chafe in our lives. We all have the things that we need to let go and just forbear. And then when we make mistakes because we're human, we need to forgive because no one is perfect. And if you expect perfection from others, you'll never have friends for very long. You know why I think I, I've tried to count it up? I think I have about a hundred what I consider close friends. And the reason is, is because I value them and I've kept them for a lifetime. Steve Nordak, I haven't talked to in over 10 years probably on the phone. But he's the one that first gave me a plaque with what I just read about the shave. And he partly by being my friend taught me then how to be a friend with unconditional love and speaking the truth in love and getting in my face when I needed someone to get in my face. That's being a friend. Bear with one another and forgive one another. And then Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens and this way you fulfill the law of Christ. See, you can, you can bring your burdens to Jesus. The Bible says uh, uh, that uh, to bring, bring your cares to, to, to the Lord for he cares for you. And the Bible invites us to Jesus to bring our burdens. But God has put people in your life to bear one another's burdens over and over. It says bear one another's burdens. And we have trouble. If you're not in trouble, someday you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have heartache. It might be someone you love. You're going to have struggle. And you need people to walk through you. When my dad died, one of my best friends is Larry Blixt. He was on my doorstep within 10 minutes of finding out that my father had passed. And I cried about that for a year, and I still in the shower will cry, and it's been since 1992 that my father passed. Friends are treasures better than anything this world can offer you. It's a gift, they're gift, gifts from God. And so bear one of those burdens. That's why we need to be connected. That's why our church offers fellowship opportunities so you can connect. That's why the Bible says that hospitality is one of the highest callings for both elders and deacons. It's a high calling to be hospitable, to invite people over, to have little meals, to, to share food together, to connect. It's a spiritual thing. That's why the small group thing that Pastor Kerry is pushing us that we should all do what we can and be willing to commit to something, turn off the television and connect with people and be in small group. Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens and this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And then Proverbs 18, 24. It says this, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. A lot of people want friends, but they're not friendly. They don't reach out. They don't know how to be a friend. And it goes on and it says, there are friends who destroy each other, but real friends stick closer than a brother. You know, spiritual friends are, it's not true that blood is thicker than water always. There are spiritual friends that know how and have the character of God and the Spirit of God in them to be a friend like none others. But here's the thing, it says there are friends who destroy each other. There are people without God, without the character of God, without the nature of God, without the fruit of His Spirit, and they're trying to be friends and they hurt each other because they're jealous, because they're greedy because they're sensual, because they don't have the character of God, and they end up hurting each other. 
And so even in the church, when you're carnal, you will hurt other people. Building closeness. And when they do, forgive. Don't get bitter at the church. Is that church people? No, it's a person. The church isn't for perfect people. It's for all people. And we're all at different growth stages. You know, not everybody is as spiritual as Henry and Doris. And if you want to have a friend, you can't just go, well, I deserve a friend. You've got to reach out to be a friend. I had a close relative come in here, and most people tell me this church reaches out. They're warm, and they're friendly, and they're accepting, and they're in this. And so those of you that have only been here a month or two, you might sit by a first-time visitor, and they're going to judge our whole church on how you act. So if this is your church, if you come after two weeks, you go, this is my church, you extend the warmth, the friendship, because you never know when you're sitting by someone that's here for the first time, right? Are you with me? And so this close relative stood out in the foyer, and he looked like a sourpuss. I was watching him. He's going. And afterwards he says, well, nobody is friendly. Nobody even approached me. I said, you look like a prune out there. I said, they th- no telling what they thought you might do. I wouldn't have approached you myself. I was standing back looking and said, what did he eat for breakfast? <laughs> he must have gas. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Something wrong with that guy. And then Proverbs 16, 28. A perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. Honorable friends don't gossip. If I need to tell you something that's dirt on me, I don't want you telling the world. And I'm not going to be close to you if I can't trust you. That's the kind of friend that Jesus is. He never tells anything on you. Secondly, listen, listen to this. There are people that will come to you and talk about someone you care about or some acquaintance of your friend. You hear them running their mouth and they're gossiping. It'd be like Pastor Jeff talking about Pastor Kerry and he's telling me. And, and then I say to Pastor Jeff, I say, you know what? Pastor Kerry's not perfect, but you need to go talk to him. You need to work this out. You need to share with him and confront, because love speaks the truth in love. Go and talk to him. Maybe there's misunderstanding. Work that out, right? But here's how immature people do with no godly character. They listen to that gossip, and they go, whoa, that is not nice. You shouldn't say stuff like that, but they don't say it. They just think it. They go, man, Pastor Jeff, you're supposed to be a pastor. I can't believe you're talking that way about Pastor Kerry. I think you're, you're a bad, bad pastor. But they're not saying it. So what they do, Pastor Jeff, with his words, it's like the Bible talks about words bringing death and destroying people and can destroy. And Pastor Jeff is talking about Kerry, and he's stabbing him like this, only Kerry doesn't know it. And I don't say anything. I don't tell him. I just take his words, and I run to Kerry. Guess what Pastor Jeff said about you? I take the knife from him and I go, he says you're ugly. Ah! He says you're stupid. Ah! He says your breath stinks. Ah! (laughs) Only one of those is true is about the breath. That's the only true one. (laughs) Don't, you're not being a friend. I'm not being a friend to carry if someone's talking about it. Go tell him. That's insanity. You defend your friend to whoever's talking about them and keep your mouth shut. What they don't know won't hurt them. And I can't believe how many people don't know that. I don't want to have to say it again. Mark it down. Don't forget it. And then the last one, so don't be a gossip. The last one, James 4.11, it talks about being judgmental. Brothers and sisters, don't slander one another. If anyone speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it, when you judge the law, you're not keeping it but setting in judgment on it. And one, well, I said, what, what's a great quality of a friend? They don't judge you. Well, that's exactly right. They don't just jump to conclusions and believe something terrible about you because they heard something or something you said come to a negative conclusion about you, and they don't even talk to you. At least come and clarify. Here's what I need and why Darrell Weaver is one of the best people I know. Because if I make a mistake, he knows my heart, and he'll call me up and say, Pastor, can I talk to you? So you said this, I know you didn't mean it, but this is how it can come across, be careful, yada, 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 and he speaks inside me because he knows he doesn't jump to a conclusion and label me as a jerk because someone took me like I was a jerk. And sometimes I've been taken as a jerk and I was a jerk. For that, I try to, well, between my wife and my kids and Dale Atchison, I, I get bloodied often, and so they're trying to cut the jerky out of me, but... It's still a work in progress. 
But love believes the best. You know, some people judge a rich person because they're rich. They judge a poor person because they're poor. They judge a person that's uneducated. They judge a person by what, how their job is. They judge them on how they dress. They judge them uh, on all kinds of outward things, and they don't even know them. Don't do that. I think Jesus said something like this, like, uh, you know, take care of the log in your own eye before you worry about the speck in your neighbor's eye. And then... That's character. So you, first, to be a friend, you've got to have good character. You have to have God character. Next thing is that I want to clarify a friendship. You see, Jesus had 12. He had three that were close and one that was the closest. You can't be everybody's friend, but you can act and be a, in character toward everybody like a real friend would be. And that will convince people of Jesus, who is that. 1 Corinthians 15, says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Let me tell you something. If you got the wrong friend, one thing good about social media, click unfriend. Unfriend. Because when you're running around with the wrong friends, the right friends don't want to be your friend because they don't want to run with people that do bad stuff and get corrupted by you and your bad friends. And if you don't, if you're not careful, you'll get the wrong friends and you won't have the right influences and those friends will prevent you from having great friends. So I'm telling you, friends is a big deal. It's a big deal. If you want to walk with God, it's a big deal. Bad company corrupts good character. The last thing is the closeness of friends. I'm going to take a few things out of John chapter 15 as you look back in that passage, chapter 12, chapter 15, verse 12. He says, my command is this, love each other as I've loved you. And then he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I've called you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose you, but I, I you did not choose me rather, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command to love each other. I want you to notice that it's in his heart in verse, 15, in verse 12 that we love each other as he has loved us. The heart of the Father is that we love each other the way he loves us. That's a church, that's a family. Every mother and father wants their children to be close and love each other. They don't want squabbling children. That breaks our hearts. I'm so glad my daughter loves my son and my son loves my daughter and they, they you know, my daughter-in-law and my, 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 my my, 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 my daughter's fiance, and there's a love there. There's something beautiful there. And that's what God wants. In fact, let me, let me tell you something. Listen to me. You, quit yawning. <laughs> Listen to me, man. Your dad ought to be your best friend. Your mom ought to be your best friend, is she? Yeah. She is your best friend. And you know something? And it's not surprising that you have that wisdom that she's your best friend because you're a godly teenager. And you're mature enough that it's cool to be your mother's best friend. Most people don't get that until till they're about 20 or 21 because they're little brats. <laughs> they need to be slapped. It's called the Holy Spirit gift of slapping. And then, so he wants us to be close, right? And, and, uh, but we need to be friends to others together, right? Notice in verse 15, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. Oh, that's not the verse. Where is the if at? It's verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. I wrote down 15, it's 14. If. Listen, if you want friends, it's the way you act. It's the way you treat them. There's an if to it. You can't expect to have friends and be a jerk. You can't expect to have friends and be carnal and be jealous and talk about them and be mean. You can't expect to have friends that way. You can't help, expect to have friends unless you're friendly, unless you love them, unless you're giving, unless you're caring, unless you care, you, 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 you build, build that. You're giving of yourself. I don't, I don't come into a friendship going, I need your friendship. That's needy. I don't need anybody's friendship. I want it, but I don't need it. I've got Jesus. I come into wanting to be your friend. 
and hopefully you have enough sense to be my friend back. Right? See, and then he says in verse 15, he's made known to you. He says, you're my friend. He says, hey, look what he says. This is really cool. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Some people are so private they don't want you to know anything about Well, you're close to someone, that's intimacy. That's intimacy. It's okay, they know my business. In other words, I'm open, I'm honest, I'm transparent. And then we can be close. You don't have to hide everything and be afraid. You trust that person. You don't have to be afraid to be vulnerable and be open and be honest. And he says, everything I've learned to my father, I've made known to you. In other words, we need to be known and, 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 and know. We need to know and be known. Jesus made everything known to the Father. He's saying, look, you want to be close? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you everything. And he's talking to his disciples. He told them everything. You want these close friends? you got to be vulnerable. You have to be open. You have to, to be known. And then in, in, in verse 16, notice it says, he chose, but I chose you. You didn't choose me, I chose you. So the mistake we make is we just let ha friends happen. I'm in band with them or in a team with them or I'm a neighbor with them or I'm a co-worker and we just make friends and they're bad friends. Choose your friends. Be intentional. Choose godly friends because they're going to influence you. And then, notice, he chose his friends and he poured into them that they might bear fruit. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. See, as a friend, we sharpen each other because our goal is not just to be friends and have a, a good old, no, we're pushing each other. Like a team, we make each other better. We confront with love the truth to say, here, look at yourself. You need to change this. Hey, the way you're treating your wife, you shouldn't have talked to her that way, Right? Hey, you know the way you handled that with your kid? That wasn't the smartest thing, kicking them across the restaurant. That just wasn't the best. Don't drop kick them. Don't do that. It's bad. Talk to them. Right? I'm telling you, it's important that we understand this. Pour into each other. There's a purpose for friendships to sharpen each other. In verse 17, again, be sure that you understand he wants us to love. Will you bow your heads? I just got a text from a friend. I had it up here because I read the poem. It says this. I love this. James, you're a good friend to me and a great example for me. I want you to know I appreciate your friendship and I pray for you daily. Your message is so good today. And it challenges me to do a better to be a better friend myself. I'm glad your vacation was good and you and Susan didn't get eaten by a bear. It's, it's emotional. <laughs> don't send me texts when I'm preaching if you don't want me to read them. 